Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Amen. Well, and for any visitors, let me uh, join the pastor in, in welcoming you to the Sunday School Hour this morning. Uh, I am Roy Bell, uh, uh, notoriously so, amen, in, in, in some corners. But um, as I was uh, uh, sharing with uh, um, uh, Sister Hatch uh, a few moments ago and then Brother Hatch, uh, there's, a, um, there's a great liberty um, for me uh, to come to a church like this um, that is, uh, and we know what we mean when we say real Bible believers. Amen. So there's a lot of places I go and, uh, and uh, uh, I can't mention Dr. Ruckman because they don't know him or they don't like him. <laughs> Amen. Right. But uh, so, and then when I give my testimony, there's always like, there's like a hole there. There's a gap there. You know, and and it's a, it's a joy to be able to come somewhere like this where I can fill in that gap and and also uh, talk about how the Lord used him uh, in in my life. Uh, but I, I let me start with a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we just thank you today, Lord. Um, first and foremost for Jesus. First and foremost for that blood that was shed for us for salvation, Lord God. We're so thankful for your book this morning. And uh, God, as always, just to ask you. Um, Take this old jailbird from the slammer out of the way and somehow, some way, uh, do what you do and uh, give me something to say that will encourage, edify, and bless uh, this morning and just bring honor and glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So my life's verse is uh, Philippians 1.6. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, so uh, had a had a rough start. I, I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, my my dad actually was a casino boss. Anybody that's ever, you know, watched any mafia movies or done any reading about that, he worked for Meyer Lansky, the guy that set up Bugsy Siegel. And so my dad was a real mafia guy, uh, traveled all over the world, setting up casinos when I was little. And uh, but he passed away when I was 10 years old. So came back to Las Vegas. My mom went to work. And as the story goes, I fell in with a rough crowd. I started doing, doing drugs. And of course, drugs led to stealing. And I became a little criminal uh, in my early teens and went to reform school three times. Uh, it was just... Uh, it, and one thing I should mention about my childhood is I had never been to church. I grew up in a Christless home. It was not a bad home. It was uh, um, it, there was a lot of love there. Uh, uh, it was a lot. Of, it was it was peaceful. It was a good middle class upbringing. But my mom had been raised strict Roman Catholic, and uh, um, as soon as she was old enough, she threw the baby out with the bathwater. Got away from that and was like, I don't, I'm the dumb, don't I don't want to hear no church stuff for the rest the rest of my life. And and. We'll talk about her more later because today is Mother's Day and a big happy Mother's Day to uh, all the all the mothers that are in the room this morning. And um, so my mom had to go to work and I and I and I hit the streets and I went to reform school and I was a mess. And I thought that Jesus and the Bible were like Santa Claus and the tooth fairy. I'm like, get out of here with that stuff. I don't believe anything like that. And uh, so. When I turned 18, they kicked me out of uh, a reform school and uh, right away I had the law on my tail and I took off across the country, ended up hanging out with riding with outlaw bikers and uh, a couple years go by and I find myself approaching my 21st birthday uh, in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. I was down there with a bunch of outlaw bikers and Mexican drug dealers uh, on, on the river down there. And I'd come to a point, uh, I, I can remember there was an apartment we were in and I was sitting out front and by myself on the porch one night and just kind of looking up at the sky and looking at my life. And I'm like, so man, I'm turning 21 and this is how I end up. This, this is my life. I'm, uh, I'm a criminal. I'm an outlaw. I'm on the run. I'm a drug addict. Uh, I'm look where I'm at. What I, I mean, Oh, I just kind of looked at the sky like, is this it? You know, and I, I don't believe in God, but I mean, if there's anybody out there and uh, there was somebody out there and that somebody heard my cry. And um, 
This was a motorcycle club. It was the Peacemakers out of Toledo, Ohio. And this was the second generation. In other words, th these were the kids of the original of the original guys in the group. And they began to talk about one of the old original uh, founding members of this motorcycle gang. And they called him Big Dave, Big Dave Brake. And they started talking about Big Dave's coming down. Hey, Big Dave's coming down. And boy, they started talking about Big Dave, telling Big Dave stories. And, and to hear them, he was a combination of Batman, guru, <laughs> Kung Fu, James Bond, <laughs> all rolled into one. And, uh, and Big Dave did. He showed up down there um, in this little apartment full of outlaw bikers and Mexican drug dealers. And I knew when I saw him get off, he got off an old Moto Guzzi 850 El Dorado. Anybody knows bikes? old police bike. He got off that bike and he come up the stairs. And I knew the moment that I looked into Dave Brake's eyes that whatever it was that I was missing, whatever it was that I was looking for in life, that man had it. I knew it. I knew it the minute I looked in his eyes. And I, I considered myself somewhat clever. And so I'm like, you know, I dialed in on this guy. I'm going to get his number. I'm going to figure out what this is that this guy's got that that because I know it's what I I need and what I want. And what they didn't know about Big Dave was, the guys, is that Big Dave had gotten saved and he'd become a preacher and he was involved in a Bikers for Christ motorcycle ministry. And his purpose for coming down there wasn't to hang out and, and reconnect and do the old stuff with the old fellas. His, his purpose in coming down there was to reach back uh, to, those, uh, uh, to those he had wrote, ridden with and been involved with and their kids, their family members. Big Dave was on a mission to come down there and tell everybody about Jesus Christ. And I just happened to be there. <laughs> I just, I wasn't one of this. I, I was just newly plugged in with these guys. And, uh, and he sat down on that couch there in that living room and, uh, I'm watching him hard, and he begins to talk about the Lord. He begins to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even in the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrows. The Word of God is that, is that sword that pierces and brings in the light and, and the truth. And I can remember the very verse of Scripture that that man spoke uh, from that couch on that day when the sword of God's word and God's spirit pierced the darkness of my soul and it was like it was like the Lord reached in and flipped the light switch on and he said I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and I went Poof! Jesus in the Bible Jesus is real and the Bible is true no way, no way, no way. This it, I, And I was absolutely wonderfully and gloriously saved. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, you, you hear this often, but I, as I want to, when I get to heaven, I want to appear, uh, uh, I want to compare salvation experiences with Apostle Paul on Damascus Road. I mean, I tell you what, hey, Next day, I was at a little Baptist church down the street. I'm w walking there and back, and and the and the sun is shining, and the birds are chirping, and I'm walking that high off the ground. I mean, I got saved, and through a miraculous chain of events, God brought some folks from the roll-off homes down to that little church down there in Mission, Texas. And uh, four boys, it was, and it was, now it wasn't the roll off homes in Corpus Christi. It was a uh, off branch, which was the Redemption Ranch in, uh, um, right outside of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Mississippi, and Brother Bob Wills. And they were down there for a funeral. Let's know what year this was 1981. 1981, brother and brother, brother Bob Wills, and they came to that church for the funeral of a boy from that church who'd gone to the boys' home, who had given his life diving in a frozen pond to save the director's little boy, and then he slipped back under, and and he and he died in the frozen water. And they came down for his funeral, and they brought four boys from the boys' home in their three-piece blue suits and their good haircuts and their shining testimonies. And remember, I'd been to youth prison. I'd been to reform school, but I saw these four boys come up and they talked about that boy and they gave their testimonies. And after the service, I went up to brother Bob Wills 
And listen, I hadn't been saved two weeks. I still have hair out to here like that. I'd never read the Bible. I, this is the first time I've ever been to church. I didn't know anything. I was just as green and rough as you could get. But I was saved. And Brother Bob Wills looked at me. He said, he said all, and he, he told the story. He said, he said, all I knew, he said, this guy who's out of here right here. But you could tell he was saved. And I said, I want to go with y'all. <laughs> I said, can I go with you? And Brother Bob Wills said, well, what are you saying, Brother Roy? Uh, um, you want to be a missionary? I said, okay, yeah, that's it. I want to be a missionary. He said, oh, well, we're leaving in the morning. So get in the, th get in the van. Phew, we take off. And so on the way to Mississippi, we stop in Corpus Christi. And we slept on Lester Roloff's living room floor. And that morning, Brother Roloff got up, and uh, he made breakfast for us. Brother Roloff looked at me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and he says, Brother Wills, he says, uh, who is that? And Brother Wills, well, that's Brother Roy. He's going to be a missionary. And Brother Roloff said, going to get him a haircut, ain't you? He don't look like one of our boys. <laughs> and I, so I got the next six months, I got to go to the Redemption, Redemption, House, Redemption Ranch Boys Home as a volunteer missionary outside of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and got the same program the boys got, which was the daily Daily, daily, scripture memory, scripture memory, chapel, scripture memory, scripture memory, evening chapel, scripture memory. And then they're bussing them in every service to Central Baptist Church in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, bussing them, bussing them in. And so this first six months, I mean, it was just a greenhouse for me. I got all, I got got most of the right stuff right then. And uh, then I went, uh, then I left the boys home and I moved into town to the church they had a little Bible college. And at that little Bible college, uh, I was going there. There was a there was a young lady at the Bible college, and and we began we began to date. And I fell really really in hard in love. And uh, I was ready. I was like, man, you know, this is it. Let's start our ministry and just get married. And she said, no, God called me to go to Hiles Anderson College. And so if it's the Lord's will, He'll He'll bring us back together. But I, I know what I, God wants me to do. And so I, I like I said, I was still a little green. I hadn't been saved very long, and I was like. I was like, nah. So I fought, I made the mistake. I followed her to Hiles Anderson College, and so I, I'm in now. I'm in Hiles Anderson College, probably for the wrong reasons, and uh, um, and I'm still a little rough around the edges. But now her dad has heard that I went up there too. Her dad told her, "Look, that boy's got a bad past. I don't want you messing with him." There's a lot of other you know, young men there. You can find you a preacher up there at Hiles Anderson College, and don't you know? And so I get there, and she says, "My dad said we can't date anymore." I said, "All right." So days go by, weeks go by, or whatever. And so I asked one day, I said, listen, I said, Kathy, if you can just look me in the eye and tell me that you don't love me anymore, I said, I'll, I'll leave you alone. I never bought you. And she started crying. No, I do. I'm going to talk to my dad again. I'm like, yay. So I go back to the dorm room. And in the dorm room, there was a, there was a kid named Ralph. Right? And uh, uh, Ralph, uh, like I said, I'm a little rough around the edges. I'm still a little rough around the edges. Ralph, uh, he was going to point out every little rough edge I had. Everything there was nothing I could say or do that uh, Ralph did not have a criticism. He was yang, 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 right. That was Ralph. And so I come back and I'm telling the rest of the guys, "Hey, I just talked to Kathy. She's going to call her dad. We're probably going to be able to date again." And blah, blah, blah. And Ralph comes out and he goes, "I don't see, even know what you see in her. She don't impress me at all." And I'm a little rough around the edges, so so I do one of these at him. I said, "Man, shut up." <laughs> and he went, and he went. He went back at me, and I messed his mouth all up real bad. <laughs> Meantime, Kathy's called her dad. Her dad's called the dean. They've threatened to, to if I don't, they don't get rid of me, pull all the students from the church out of the school. And I'm in the dean's office the next day, and uh, I'm a stalker, and I'm beating up roommates. And uh, anyways, that was the end of Hiles Anderson College for old brother Roy. <laughs> and uh, and I got. I got mad. I got, I got, I got bitter, and I tried to take it all back. I said, because I said, listen, I, I hadn't, I hadn't been saved even just barely over, over a year, right? This is this is a year, year and a half, right, right here. Uh, I'm, we're still right here now, going in eight, 82, going into eighty three. You know, this is it's all in a very small period of time, and. I'm like, I don't know what happened. And I got, I got brainwashed. Uh, I got tricked into some car. I, I don't know. And now nah, forget all that. I'm, I'm taking it all back. I'm going back to Las Vegas and, uh, and I ran from God. And, and, and so what I, what I always say is, 
uh, um, it's impossible to run from somebody that lives inside of you. Uh, uh, and that goes back to my life's verse. My first life's verse was uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, uh, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And uh, that didn't work out so good. Because <laughs> I went back. So that, that's why I adopted that then as my life's verse. And, you know, uh, uh, he, he's going to finish that somehow, some way. He's going to finish that good work he started in you. And uh, so that... That is the, that's where my ran began, my Jonah run. Where, uh, uh, God, had, God had, had me started in the ministry, and I quit like John Mark, and I tried to go back. And um, that ended up uh, costing me 30 years of my life in prison. I spent 30 calendar years in prison. I went to prison four times. I have over 12 felony convictions, mostly bank robberies, armed robberies. Um, I. Uh, escaped twice. I have two escape convictions, and they've given me I think, a three strikes raw law. I, I have two habitual criminal enhancements. And uh, so uh, my final one, my last one, um, it was 2010, and I got, a, and, and they gave me the big habitual criminal. Life. It was called a 10 to life. It was life with parole, but it was 10 to life. I'm 50 years old. I just got a brand new life sentence, 10 to life, which means you will see a parole board in 10 years. But when you've been to prison four times, you have 12 felony convictions, you've escaped twice and have two habitual criminal enhancements, you don't make your parole board. I'm just saying. I knew I was done. I'm in prison. I did this. So, you know, I, I, I knew it when I was, when, after that last robbery, when I was laying on the hood of that cop car, I was, I said, it's one through my mind. I said, I'm dying in prison now. And I knew that. And, uh, 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 so I got, I got to the prison and that's kind of where I hit my bottom. Uh, that's where I, I finally quit running. And I said, I'm going to be in prison for the rest of my life. I'm going back to the chapel and whatever's left of my life. I'm just going to, I'm just going to surrender to God because I, I want my peace back. I want my fellowship back with him. I'm done running. I'm tired. And I'm going to go back to the chapel. And it was up at the, up at that chapel. And I thought, Surely that the ministry ship had long sailed. You know what I, mean? I just want to be in chapel. I just want to be around God's people. I just want my peace back, you know. But it, it didn't take long uh, before they, Brother Roy, open us up on a word of prayer. Brother Roy. And uh, long story short, uh, I spent the last decade, the last 10 years, uh, High Desert State Prison, a 4,000 man unit uh, north of Las Vegas. I spent that last 10 years assigned to the chapel as the chaplain's assistant. And it's a, a big, it's a big prison. So um, every unit has its own chapel day. You can't get everybody in there at once. So uh, what my job for the last decade that I was in prison was get up Monday, go down, do, ch do services for unit one, get up Tuesday, go down, do services for unit two. But um, something happened at the beginning of all my doing of my doing time and uh, that is uh, when I was down there in Mississippi at the little Bible college, uh, a, guy, a friend of mine named Jim, if you're watching Jim, we reconnected. Um, he handed me a little pamphlet called a survey of the authorized version by Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. And, and you, you know, I'm brand new. I'd never been to church. I didn't know anything. But I read that pamphlet and I got what I got what this book is. Amen. I said, oh, OK. I get it. I get it. That I understand. That's God's book, and that's perfect. There was just no doubt in my mind. I was just, I was just dumb enough to believe it. Hey, Amen. And uh, so I got that. So when I did get to prison, um, I said, I want to read some more about that. And so I remember what his name was, and I wrote to Doctor Ruckman, uh, starting in probably about 1990 is when I wrote him, and he wrote me back, sent me some books. And I wrote him back, and he wrote me back and sent me some books. And that went on for 25 years. Sent me every book he ever wrote. I've got, I've got a stack of the, and I'll, I'll share you, I'll try to share this with you this morning before I run out of time. Um, what, when should I stop, Pastor? Oh, okay. I've got plenty of time. Plenty of time. All right. 
And uh, uh, so I, I am in possession of the, the lost writings of Peter S. Ruckman. Hey, this stuff you ain't heard yet. Hey, man. <laughs> and uh, so I'll, I'll share some of that with you in a minute. But so uh, I already had the book. I already knew the book. Uh, uh, I just hadn't been in a place where I was consistently living the book. Amen. And uh, but at this point and now in the chapel and that's and that's and that's what I got to do every every day for that last 10 years. Uh, I was I was in prison. I got to go up and I got to preach and teach God's word and work in the chapel. And I didn't feel like I was in prison. I felt like a, just a missionary that lives on the foreign field. And uh, um, and I everybody. Uh, and, and that's why that's where I met Brother Sean, uh, Brother Sean uh, uh, and the men from Bible Baptist Church. Uh, were coming out uh, uh, doing services, uh, uh, volunteers in the prison. And um, we uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, being like-minded uh, in the faith, uh, I was drawn to them. And guys would hit me up on the, on the yard and say, Pastor Roy, who's coming up this weekend? I'd say, my church. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I still think I'm never going to get out. And the chaplain would tell Sean, uh, uh, yeah, Roy ain't never getting out. That's what everybody thought. And then COVID hit. COVID hit. And what happened when COVID hit was that um, people that work at the prison quit coming to work. And so they slammed the cell doors and didn't open them again for two years. So, they, you know, two-man cell, little cell sitting on those bunks. And we had no, no outside, no exercise, no sunshine, no fresh air, no nothing. They came every three days shackle you up, take you for a five-minute shower, and put you back in the box. That was, that was it. They, they just didn't have anybody. They, they'd throw some mystery meat under your door a, a couple times a day to keep you alive. They just didn't have anybody to work the prison system. You had all these people locked up, and there was no, there was no officers. There, there, was, there was nobody to do anything. And so they, the state of Nevada said, listen, we've, we've got to do something here. So in a situation where most people would come to the parole board and not get parole, they'd say, okay, no, we'll see again in another five years or we'll see again in three years and deny, deny. And that's the way parole works. They said, look, at what we're going to do, anybody that hasn't killed anyone and they're eligible for parole, we're going to let them go. And it just happened to be my 10 years on my 10 to life sentence that was just coming up. And May 3rd, 2021, I just celebrated my three year anniversary. They let me out of prison. Amen. They let me out of prison. I went right to Bible Baptist Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. And um, the, the Lord had he put some things on my heart. Um, I do, uh, I do a, on, some online ministry. And uh, I understand that it's shark-infested waters, and, and, and it's a lot of junk, and people are going there and thinking they're going to church and not showing up in the pews. And, and I, I pressed that point uh, uh, hard. I just did a video called uh, uh, um, uh, Christianity Without the Local Church is Witchcraft. That's a video I just came out, I just came out and did. But, but God kind of, uh, I'd never had a computer. I'd never had a smartphone. I, I didn't have any. But I'd seen on my little 12-inch TV in the cell, I'd seen the genesis, the birth of the whole culture and the phenomenon and all that. And, you know, the Bible talked about, you know, we've got we to gotta go and take the gospel to the people where they are. And what I noticed just from watching my little TV in my cell was that's where all the people are. They're all right there. And I said, well, you know what I'm going to do? And I, I heard what a YouTube channel was and stuff. I'm going to get a YouTube channel, and I'm going to get in that phone, and I'm going to come back at them, right? And so this is before I ever even knew I was getting out. I was like, man, if I ever get out, this is what I would do. And I drew this little picture years, years before I ever got out. Uh, and, it's, and if you've ever been to my YouTube channel, that's what it looks like. And I made a little Charlie Brown, Roy Bell in a suit. He full, actually folds down. He's got his little bookcases and... And the little diplomas behind him, and 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 God, God brought that little like idea, vision, you know, whatever. He brought it to reality, and so I've got that the YouTube channel out there now. Uh, we got over twenty thousand subscribers. Uh, uh, my uh, videos are getting uh, watched. I'm no Gene Kim for sure, but uh, uh, my videos are getting watched about a hundred thousand times a month. And so uh, this the same thing that I was giving the guys in that chapel for ten years. I I just talk to my phone and do the same thing. And now um, 
with that, then people started becoming aware of who I was and what I was doing. And I had, you know, our crowd, King James, Bible believing pastors all over the country started getting in touch with me and say, Hey, brother Roy, Hey, brother Roy, if you're ever over here, Hey, brother Roy, uh, if you're ever in the neighborhood. And so after I got so many of those, I said, well, let me see if I can't get in the neighborhood. And, uh, um, so uh, I'm very limited because I am on parole for life because I had a life sentence. So, uh, I have, what I have to do it, it to travel is, um, this right here, <laughs> it's like, that's, that's my paperwork. That's my travel pass. This, uh, this allows me for 25 days to be in uh, Wisconsin, Florida, uh, Illinois, and Michigan <laughs> for 25 days. And then, uh, then I turn into a pumpkin. Amen. And, uh, but so that, and that, and that's just, and so I stepped right into a ministry. God, God just kind of just picked up what I had been doing all those years in the chapel and just kind of taking it to a, to a wider congregation, if you will. Um, Dr. Ruckman, in the years, if you can imagine being just an old jailbird in a slammer, and, you know, and one day Dr. Ruckman sends you a new book, and it's called Memoirs of a 20th Century Circuit Riding Preacher. And you read that whole book, and you get to the last five or six pages, and he starts talking about well, and there's this pastor's here, and these are guys that are still fighting the fight, and this guy's here, and this pastor's here. And he gives a page to an old jailbird and a slammer out in Las Vegas, Nevada. If you can imagine the encouragement that that was to me, that book, and I read that. And, uh, and you know, a lot of the, uh, shall we say, sweeter-spirited brethren that were so quick to to uh, 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 criticize and talk about oh how mean he was and everything. Listen, they when I first time I failed, they kicked me to the curb. They would have nothing to do with me. But listen, I failed over and over again. I went to prison four times. I tried to come back and get it right, and I'd fall again. I tried to come back. I'd better, but you know what? Dr. Ruckman, he was just stupid enough to believe that Philippians 1, 6, 2. He just believed that what the work that God started, he never gave up on me. He never judged me. He kept loving me. He kept sending me his books. He kept, and he kept writing me. And I got a whole stack of, of, of letters and correspondence uh, uh, from Dr. Ruckman. And I'd like to, uh, I have a favorite letter, and I'd like to read that this morning for you, if I may. And... This is Dr. Ruckman telling an old jailbird how to stay out of the slammer. But it could just as well be Dr. Ruckman telling anybody how to stay right with God and walk with God out here. Amen. And he, he wrote this before I got out of prison one time, and I didn't do what he said, and I came back to prison. But I got out this time, and praise God, did everything he told me to do in this letter. He said, Dear Brother Bell, I still have the souvenir you gave me from the old days in Vegas where you and some of your buddies uh, were. You made me a lion with whiskers on it, and I've had this placed in my office where I work since the day you sent it to me, which has been many years ago. I'm sorry things didn't pan out for you. And if you get out again, I hope to God you'll get and stay in the right company. It's not enough, Roy, just to know the book, reform, repent. It's not enough. Evil communications corrupt good manners. A companion of fools shall be destroyed. A guy that's been through what you've been through has to change company. And at your age, it's almost impossible. They say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And the guys you've been with now for years and years are the wrong gang. You've got to find some way, Roy. And I don't know how you do it. But you got to find some way to get in a good Bible-believing church and make yourself go there every Sunday morning and Sunday night and get the hell preached out of you by a man who can really preach. Meet the people there and get to know them. Now, Christians can be some of the meanest people in the world. I've been saved 57 years, and I could write you a book on the devil, not of Christians. You cannot let them get you down. And you cannot use them all as stereotype profiles of hypocrites because they're not. But you'll have to eat crow to get in with a bunch of them and find the right ones to grow in grace with. He said, and you're able to do it. <laughs> what you've been through has disciplined you. Uh, so you have to do it. The problem is, Roy, when you get out, you have to make yourself do it without the pressure. And if you can make yourself do it, you'll come clean next time and you'll stay clean. But, buddy, you got to stay in that book. you got to have a prayer life. And above all, you got to avoid any attempts to make easy money. 
I understand the, pro the problem perfectly. And then he goes on to talk about some of the, the financial situation and making money and stuff. And um, he says, listen, uh, uh, he said, I'm preaching to kids nine years old in orange pajamas. Nine years old, you say. For what? Murder. I've preached in, in 91 pretty prisons these years and everything from county jails to city jails to maximum security and commercial prisons. And buddy, this country is going to hell so fast the next 15 couldn't catch up with it. I've had boys tell me, but what do I have to get a job for? Shoot, man, I know where if I take a paper bag from a guy with something in it and put it in a telephone booth every night after I get off work, he'd give me $100 every time. I said, now, Roy, you know the ropes. I'm not going to preach to you about them because you've been through them. But I've had three, I had three federal offenses on my docket when I was 17 years old, bootlegging and driving a stolen car across straight line. My role models when I was a boy were Pretty Boy Floyd, Machine Gun Kelly, Babyface Nelson, John Dillinger, Lucky Luciano, and Al Capone, and all that bunch. He said, when I got saved, I had to change them. My mentors and role models had to be people like Martin Luther, J. Frank Norris, Billy Sunday, and those fellows. And Roy... There's no way you can stay balanced with bad communications. It cannot be done. And some of that old crowd you knew, actually, some of them have more loyalty, more bravery, and character than some saved people you're going to meet. If I had known everything about Christians when I was saved that I know now, I never would have become a Christian. But after 57 years, I know what a man has to do. He's got to break the ties. He's got to burn his bridges behind him. He has to learn how to live a dull life. And you're going to have one H of a time learning how to do it. Um, he goes, uh, so I'm, and he says, buddy, I wish you all the luck in the world. You know I'm with you. I'm with the prisoners. I always have been. He said, but you got to stay clear of that crowd when you get out. If you do get out and you cannot mess with them. And they're going to watch you to break probation like a hawk and get another alibi again. And the only thing to do is to come clean and clear, come all the way. I would suggest that if you get out, the best thing you could do was get under some heavy and hard preaching and get engaged in track distribution, get something in your house fixed. There's, there's no weapons. Uh, he said, uh, uh, and if you can, marry a clean Christian girl. Best thing to do is lead them to Christ and then marry them if you can get one that way. Uh, but if that doesn't work out and you have to go it alone, okay. But no more birds of a feather flocking together. Roy, it is not going to work. You're God's child now, and he's not going to let you keep getting back in the hog wallow and wallowing with the hogs. This time, you're going to have to make a clean break, and I mean cold turkey. And that's Dr. Peter Ruckman, and that was uh, October 11th, 2006. And that's, that's, my, that's my favorite letter from Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. And then after he passed, um, Brian Donovan actually published an article I wrote in the Bible Believer's Bulletin. So, yeah, how many other guys, from Jailbirds from the Slammer, got, it, got published in the Bible Believer's Bulletin? Amen. So that um, that pretty much wraps up my testimony, brings me to uh, to where we are today, and I, I, I'm just so thankful that we serve a gracious and a loving and a forgiving God. And there's no hey, <laughs> there's there's not just a second chance. As long as you're willing to get up and get dust off your knees and get going, the fight is still on. So God God bless you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we take